Welcome. 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 This is West Meadows at Home. Welcome to West Meadows at Home. It's our online experience of what we do in person on Sunday morning. If you're joining us for the first time, we are so glad that you're here. We welcome you here to this place, to this moment with us today. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for a time of singing. We're going to pray together. And teaching. Welcome and join us as we sing and celebrate the greatness of the Lord.
are forever grateful and we're forever going to be praising your name. As it also says in Psalms 113 verses 1 to 3, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord for this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen. Amen. Amen.
To a place of worship and we've offered our praise to you and Lord you are so deserving of that praise we thank you for being here with us in our homes and Lord you hear us every time we pray and cry out to you and so we thank you for listening, for hearing, and for being a God that cares individually about each one of us. And so Lord, if we have a heavy heart, comfort us. Lord, if we're burdened by burdens of the world, help us to shoulder those. Help us to take on your yoke, which is light. And Lord, if we're entering a time of trial right now, um, possibly losing our job or transitioning to something different, help us to truly rely on you for all that we need. Knowing full well that you give us all that we need 
in all circumstances, and that we can survive on your power alone. And Lord, help us to have a heart that's overflowing with thanksgiving, a heart that's overflowing with that deep, deep love of the Father, a heart that is full of offerings to give to you, whether it be song, whether it be deed, whether it be resources. Lord, help us to hold everything that you've given us with open hands, holding it out as an offering to you. Continue to be with us today, Lord, and throughout the coming week. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we enter our time of offering. And so if you click the give button up on the screen above us, if you're watching on our online platform, that'll take you to our website. And there's many different ways you can give. They're all outlined there. And uh, if online or electronic is not your way, feel free to come by the office and, and drop off your offerings there. Um, if you're on Facebook, just hop over to our website, westmeadows.org, and find the give tab also up in the corner. And that'll take you to the same spot that our online platform does. If you're new with us today, welcome. You are so welcome here. And so we want to get to know you a little bit better. Just feel free to text the number that's on the screen below me here, and somebody will be in contact with you as quick as they can. Along with that, we also have a kids edition of Pastor 411, a series we're currently in, coming up on Father's Day. And so kids, continue to send your questions in to pastor411 at westmeadows.org. Um, if if your parents aren't letting you touch electronics, just ask them a question and get them to submit it for you. And so we're just looking forward to getting more of those in. And Pastor Thena and Pastor Merrick will be sharing with us on that Sunday. So it'll be a real treat as the, the pastor to the children will also be speaking there too. And so it's, it's really for you kids to be able to get your questions answered. So we're looking forward to that. Um, also, today is the second edition of Pastor 411. And so we're going to hear from Pastor Mark and me. And so here's a little bit of showmanship for you as we transition from me right here to me. Well, welcome to week two of Pastor 411. Uh, Pastor Mark with you here again. And Pastor Andrew. Pastor Andrew. Absolutely. Uh, we're really glad you've joined us for week two of this. Uh, and in light of uh, the last week, thank you so much for the emails that we've received and the phone calls we've received. Uh, a lot of people have uh, expressed their appreciation uh, and agreement with uh, some of the answers that we gave last week. But it uh, doesn't mean everybody has to agree with everything that we say. I'm sure you wouldn't mind some dialogue afterwards if there's any questions or yeah, totally. concerns that come up. Yeah, if you guys want to continue conversations with us, just send all of us either an email, yep. phone call, text message, whatever. Yeah. Uh, just continue the conversation if you want to, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we're always glad to hear from you. Um, th these are questions that we've done a lot of research into and have some uh, personal and pastoral experience into. And so we're, we're confident in, uh, in the answers we, we want to share with you. But uh, we know that there's uh, opportunity within the church community to discuss these things. So thanks for your support, your encouragement, and definitely uh, continue the dialogue with us even after today's uh, service ends. So let's, uh, let's get to our first question for this week. Uh, it's an interesting one that just came in a couple of days ago. Uh, and it, it's this. It says, we notice that your chairs sway a little bit as you sit in them. Do they spin all the way around? Well, as a matter of fact, they do. And we're back. And that's the last time we'll probably do that on Pastor 411. So... <laughs> But let's get to a serious question uh, that somebody sent in to us. And it's one that has to do with the spiritual discipline. Uh, a discipline that sometimes people hear about but don't fully understand or know how to participate in. And so, Andrew, I wonder if you can lead us off today and answer this particular question. What is fasting and how would I start if I wanted to practice fasting? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. It's one of these spiritual disciplines that we definitely don't... Um, preach on a bunch, or we don't cover off in a lot of other Bible study settings, it's often something that's glossed over. So it's a great question, uh, and it's a great spiritual practice that is all throughout the Bible. Um, so we'll start with the first part of that question, what is it? 
And so it's simply abstaining from something for a specific purpose is a pretty general, broad statement that can kind of cover off mm -hmm. what fasting is. There's many different types. And so there's fasting from food and uh, other liquids, but not water. So that's the most common one you probably will encounter as something to do. There's also fasting from specific things. And so during Lent, this is often a practice that is um, part of people's regular rhythms. And so they will abstain from one thing like chocolate or sometimes people do coffee or caffeine. Yeah, electronics. Um, electronics, yeah. Social yep. media even is something that people will fast from. Uh, another way to fast is also an absolute fast. And so something that's absolute is kind of like complete, all-encompassing, right? And so the absolute fast is no liquid at all. So you do the same thing as the first one, but you cut out water as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the extreme version of a fast, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. But along with that, what kind of time frames would you use for fast is part of kind of having to figure out what to do during fasting. And so there are specific time frames outlined for us, um, but a good starting point is 24 hours is generally a good rule of thumb. Um, but it can also be something that isn't time bound, but can be part of your regular worshipful rhythm of life. And so in Luke 2, we actually see this and we see Anna, she was fasting and praying. She did not depart from the temple where she was, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And so she's fasting there and praying as part of her service to the Lord. So not a time-bound thing, but that was more of a regular rhythm in her life. Yeah. And so for me, I've experienced this uh, during youth ministry with like a 30-hour famine. And so that's when the kids will come and we're kind of locked into the church. And it's a big, fun kind of youth event, but we're fasting for 30 hours. And so that's the one that I've often taken part of as a personal example, um, just as a kind of a starting point that even youth are able to accomplish. There. So at one like that, they would fast from food, but they probably still have water and juices. Yeah. Like that. That's the type of fast. Typically, that's yeah, yeah. I like to stick to just the water, but yep. yeah, there's definitely juice, juice available during those times for mm -hmm. kids because it's a brand new practice to them and something yep. they're not used to. Take and the edge off a little if bit. they're at school, typically, uh, they definitely need the energy to stay focused throughout the day there. Yeah. Yeah. There's also other biblical examples of this. And so we find in the story of Esther. And so for those of you that don't know, story of Esther, really, really briefly, the story of Esther reveals at a point that she must act to try to save all of the Jews in her area, including herself. Uh, but she has to do, she has to break the law a little bit in her practice on how to fix the situation. So she asks them in Esther 4, 16, um, to hold a fast on her behalf and do not eat or drink for three days. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. And so going to the king was kind of the thing that you don't just do. And so she, but she was going to do this. And she fasted for three days there. And that was an absolute fast, no water, no food. And so that's kind of a little area where we see the Bible lining up with what we understand in science as well there, that you can't go three days without, more than three days without water. So yeah. that was, that's kind of cool to see that. Um, but there's also other um, ones that have no specific time frame, kind of like Anna's, but they're more goal-oriented. So you're, you're fasting and praying towards a specific decision or thought that you have in your life. Yeah. Okay. And so the purpose of a fast, um, besides dropping some of those COVID pounds that we may all have, um, the theology behind fasting is really a theology of priorities and focus. It's not on the physical side of things. It's not about weight loss. That is not the motivation behind this practice, but it's more of a taking your body and allowing yourself to be more spiritually dependent and sustained by God there. Mm -hmm. And so um, it kind of brings us to the words of Jesus, who his priority and focus during his 40-day fast in the, in the desert, he comes out of that when he's challenged to make this bread for himself. He says, man does not survive on bread alone. And so that focus is not on the food side of things, but this this divine sustenance that he has in his father. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the reason, whether it be a big decision in our life, a big change, like Jesus who was entering ministry after that 40 days in the desert, a time of trial in our lives can draw us into fasting. Maybe it's just a regular ryth rhythm of worship in our life. But the purpose of the fast is to provide an additional focus on God and an additional uh, ability to remain sustained and relying wholly on him. So that's kind of the purpose and the what's of it. Yeah. But 
So if somebody uh, now has a bit of an understanding of fasting and say, well, okay, I, how would I include that as a rhythm in my life? Where, where would you recommend they start? Yeah, and so the how-to part of that question. And so for me, uh, this is just personal stuff that I've kind of experienced and looked into. So there are different ways to do this, but this is a good rubric if this is your first time that you're going to try to fast or anything, that this would be a great thing to kind of follow. Um, so first off, don't do it on a whim. Right. Don't just willy-nilly kind of go and be like, yeah, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast. Um, because there's a few questions that you probably want to address that might come up during that that could cause issues later on. Um, so you have to decide when to start. And so a good rule of thumb is typically to start after eating breakfast because you've slept, you're refreshed, you've fed yourself for the day to kind of start and then take that 24-hour period after breakfast and start counting then. Because then you have a full stomach, then you're able to move forward. Rather than starting in the evening, which would... Uh, the food that you ate at supper would then be used to sleep and you wake up hungry and that makes your day a lot harder for sure. You also will probably want to tell people that you're going to fast um, because if you don't, they may, when your wife or your, anybody makes you dinner, uh, you, you might get a question of why aren't you eating and uh, I made this meal for you. This is, and so you might be sleeping on the couch as well as fasting that night. So um, you just might want to tell some people about that. Also, if it's a personal reason or one of those tough trial times in your life and you're trying to seek God more, you may not want people to be prying into that issue in your life. And they may just be asking out of general concern, but it might be a, an awkward situation for you. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I said, start with a small time period, 24 hours. Um, and don't start the fast by gorging or anything like that because uh, that's just going to spark a metabol your metabolism and make you more hungry very soon after that, and it's not going to do it. And don't start with an absolute fast. Those are just kind of some rule of thumbs. Um, it's hard enough um, to, to abstain from food mm -hmm. that all liquids would just kind of, you'd be really, you'd probably fall off. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. Sure. so that's kind of the how-to towards fasting. So if you have more questions about that or you, or you want to maybe do it, but you don't want to do it alone, I'm totally willing to support you in that practice Good. as well. So feel free to reach out and... Uh, so that's that's Thanks for that information. I yeah. think it's helpful to a lot of people mm. who have heard about this but don't maybe understand the purpose and how to how to engage in it. So thank you very much for for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. And so our second question today kind of ties into to mm -hmm. fasting. And so a um, bunch of our questions have been topical, but this one's very pointed at a specific scripture. And so somebody submitted a question um, around Mark 18, verses 21 and 22. Yeah. And so... Uh, what do those mean? Yeah, what's Jesus talking about there? Well, it's, it's a great question. We appreciate that one. It allows us to, to open up the scriptures and do a little bit of a brief Bible study here. Because sometimes as we read the teachings and the sayings of Jesus, it can feel like he's, he's addressing one topic and then he suddenly just jumps to something else or, or to another story. And, and, and more often than not, what's happening is those, those harder to follow teachings uh, are based upon a, a lack of historical context or historical setting or awareness that we have. And that's why it's always important when we come across these difficult passages to understand kind of what's happening ahead of that passage and a bit of what comes afterwards, to, to put it in the context of, of Scripture itself. And this is exactly one of those situations where there are some ancient Near Eastern cultural practices and some Jewish practices taking place that we're not necessarily that familiar with. And just to set the context and the stage a little bit here, what's taking place here is that people of this time believed and worshipped in a certain way, but then Jesus ends up on the scene, and he's bringing a new teaching, and he's bringing a new way of living that was different than what they had had, especially within the Jewish belief system for many, many centuries and generations. And this leads to obvious questions. In this case, the question revolves around fasting. Because there are a few groups of people who are fasting, and they look at Jesus, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, and saying, why aren't you and your people fasting? And, and here's, here's where we go in verse 18 very briefly. Now John's disciples, that's John the Baptist's disciples, and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Now, what is fasting in this particular time? Andrew just did a great job of explaining fasting for how we would understand it and practice it. But it was a little bit different back in the Old Testament understanding and, and uh, religious practices. You see, this was an act that people would engage in as a sign of what had become kind of religious piety. 
Uh, other reasons people would fast were to express mourning or sorrow. And, and in fact, uh, the Jewish system of worship observed five annual fasts that were focused upon atonement, uh, seeking the atonement, forgiveness of God. There were other fasts that were focused upon commemorating the destruction of the temple and, and, and the, uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. In addition to that, Pharisees would fast two times per week, and they often had reached a point where they would do this as a public act of piety. Now, Jesus and his followers were not following these weekly nor seasonal feasts like all the other Jews, and so it leads to this question as to why. And his response we find in, in verse 19 and 20, where Jesus answered them and says, how can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he was with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them. But the time is coming when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Now here Jesus associates fasting and what they're doing with this idea of loss and sorrow. And that they would fast for the purpose of seeking God's provision. Seeking God to restore something that had been lost in their lives. Seeking God's provision for atonement. Well, Jesus is God's provision in all of those ways. And so he's kind of saying, I'm here, guys. And this is not a time for mourning. It's not a time for sorrow. It is a time for joy and celebrating like they would understand at a Jewish wedding. You see, these weddings that they would hold were like week-long parties where they would feast, not fast. They would sing, not wail. They would experience blessings, not loss. Therefore, when Jesus is present... It is no time to fast. Instead, it's a time to celebrate. However, he does in verse 20 give us a foreshadowing of when he would be taken and then it would be appropriate to fast again at that moment. And this sets the context for what Jesus says in verse 21 and 22, which is the nature of the question before us today. And I'm going to read these analogies to you and then we're going to quickly just wrap up how this all ties together. So he says in verse 21, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skin, and both the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. These examples of the old garment and the old wineskin are meant to symbolize the rigid, dry religion that the Pharisees were promoting and practicing. Basically, and this was being experienced in their fasting rituals, where fasting had become something they do out of obligation, out of strict adherence to the letter of the law, out of a pious public display of how holy and, and they were as the religious leaders. But Jesus' message was very different. Jesus was saying this isn't about, about just obligatory obedience. He was saying that I'm inviting you to a personal relationship with the Father, and when you come to that personal relationship, it leads to a changed heart, and a changed heart that, that grows in love and grace and freedom. So we can see there's two very different systems, two very different messages taking place here. And so Jesus uses these two analogies to say, I'm not here to patch the old system. I'm not here just to be a patch onto an old garment because it's not going to work. Eventually it's going to rip apart and it's going to make the tear worse. He's not here to just fill up old dry wineskins. If you imagine a wineskin, a, like a piece of, of leather, for example, that has, has shrunk down and become brittle and rigid, and you start to pour wine into it as it starts to swell, eventually it's going to crack and burst. It's not able to contain the new wine being poured into it, and it just spills out and gets wasted. Wasted, not, not the person drinking the wine getting wasted. I mean the, the, the wine itself and the wineskin gets wasted. See, Jesus is explaining he didn't come to patch up the old covenant where it had gone wrong. He had come to renew what God had always intended for it to be, what he had promised for generations for it to be. And it leads to the question, what do we do with that today? Well, today we still in our own Christian circles, there are situations, there are people who will take the good news of Jesus, this new message, this new covenant, and they will turn it into a dry, rigid, brittle system where the focus is upon making sure there's outward public piety that's expressed to the world, making sure the world knows exactly what I believe and exactly what I'm against. And when that happens, it's actually evidence that their garments and their wineskins do not actually contain, cannot contain the grace-filled life that Jesus offers. This is what's somewhat related to the saying you may have heard, Christianity is not about a religion, 
It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God, not just about strict adherence to certain laws. And so help us sort of understand a bit of what Jesus is saying in this passage, but, but also provides for us a little bit of a warning as well as we examine how we receive this, this, this new wine, this, this uh, new teaching from Jesus, this grace-filled, loving life that uh, he makes available to us, and how we therefore not only receive that message, but then also carry that message with us and display it to the world around us. So uh, that, that's quickly uh, what I think we can understand and learn from that particular passage, that saying of Jesus we have there. So let's have a look at another question here. Uh, and this one relates somewhat to a, a spiritual discipline as well, but also relates to somewhat the situation, the time in which we live right now. We know during this COVID season, people have experienced losses of a variety of type. And one of those losses people experienced is in the area of employment and therefore in how much money they're earning. And it led to a question where people have asked us this, what if I don't have enough to give 10% to the church? It's, a, it's an important question for people at many seasons, but in particular, this particular season we're in right now where there's some hardships financially for people. And so, Andrew, I wonder if you could shed some light on, uh, on how we can view that. Yeah, totally. First off, yeah, for those that are, that are experiencing this, this hardship in this time, don't, don't hear us answering this question as, as a call to, to up your giving or to, to give to a point where it's going to harm your family or be able to limit your ability to, to feed your family or, or pay your bills or anything like that. So don't, don't hear this as, like a, as a backhanded thing at all. This is totally a, a question that was submitted, and we just truly believe that this is uh, something we can address and, and shed some light into in this time as well. Um, but this baseline of a 10% giving is a concept that's been in, been in the church basically for a very, very long time. Yeah, it, it, it's a commandment that was to be acted upon from the Old Testament law, and it was for the Israelite nation. Um, and they spoke in terms of giving the first fruits of their labor to God um, because they were an agricultural society, and they were driven um, by God's blessing and a lot of stuff linked to that. And so they uh, were asked to give that first fruit um, back to God. And that first fruit was also a portion that was given to a particular portion of their nation, the Levites, and so the, the priestly order. And so that supported the work of the temple um, and all things as part of the sacrificial system as well, which was kind of a way for them to maintain relationship, right relationship with God. And so they were giving to that and supporting that. So that's kind of why the church has adopted a 10% as the baseline. Um, so that kind of briefly gives you an understanding as to where the 10% came from. It's not just an arbitrary number that was grabbed out of the air that kind of made stuff easy to figure out. Um, but are we still required to give that 10% then? Because this is an Old Testament thing given to the Israelite nation, right? And so um, the understanding from the explanation above is that it's a tenth in its Old Testament law, but we know that Jesus came and through his life, death, and resurrection, that law has been fulfilled in him. And so placing all Christians today, not just the Israelite nation, under this new covenant in Jesus. Um, that doesn't remove the wisdom or the teaching of the law, but it does fulfill some of the obligations that were placed on the Israelites to remain in that right relationship with God. And so some of those things don't directly apply to us now. The law was made for that chosen specific people. And so, uh, yeah, that's how they remained in the right connection with God. And we can all, not just Israel, now come to God through Jesus in the fulfillment of the law that he is. Mm -hmm. Meaning that that 10% is no longer this requirement for us anymore. But to clarify now, not to say that we no longer have to give at all, and that's not what I'm trying to, yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, both of us would be out of work then, right? It's <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> um, but the idea that uh, is, not, is not to remove any uh, obligation or, or change in your heart to give. Um, but we sometimes term these things in an improper way where we term it with a tithe and offering. And so the difference is now that we're more in, in a stage where offering is our focus. Tithe is, is this word that describes 10% of giving and that commandment in the Old Testament. Um, Actually, there was a bigger requirement of giving on them. There wasn't just one tithe they were asked to give. They were asked to give many. And so this requirement is not something um, that transitions directly to us, though. But what we really mean when we uh, collect tithes and offerings in a church is we really mean we're just collecting the offerings. 
uh, we no longer are required to give that first fruit of our labor in those same ways to the Lord, but rather we are to continue to give offerings, something we freely choose. That's the difference. The requirement is something that we freely choose to offer back to God. Jesus was that perfect fulfillment and requirement for the law, and so he did that. And so, as we've already mentioned, Jesus in 1 Corinthians is described as this. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so he's fulfilled that tithe in his offering in his life. But like most other things from Jesus, um, when you hear some of his teachings in the Gospels, he doesn't eliminate the law or the requirements there, but he reveals more of the essence of what it is. And we are still called to give there. And we're called to give possibly even more now. No, there's nothing wrong with choosing 10%. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we probably both know people who said, you know, 10% doesn't put me into that sacrificial point. It doesn't put me to that point of, of where I believe God's calling me to. And, and they give more and more. I, I've even known people who have flipped it and said, I'm going to give 90 and live on 10 yeah. as opposed, which totally. is, I think, more in nature with the heart of what Jesus is talking about here, mm -hmm. where we don't just give because there's this, you know, this cap at 10 kind of thing. It's more about this, uh, this heart expression that yeah. we're called to. Exactly. Absolutely. And so... In that, we find in Romans, we're called to be living sacrifices, wholly pleasing to God. And so God does not need our possessions or our money or anything like that, because in the end, truly, it is all his, yeah. right? Um, and so, but this is, God wants a heart, a heart that overflows with gratitude, thanksgiving, and praise. And part of that is being living offerings mm -hmm. to God. And so what do we do now then? To recap, Tithe is just a 10% term, not a requirement, not a minimum, not a maximum. In order, there's no right amount to give to God, but rather we want to be giving offerings. A proper terminology for that um, is what God desires, a heart that overflows mm -hmm. with things to God. Part of that is we give our possessions. Part of that is we give of ourselves. We give of our giftings. We give of our time. We give of our energy. And we also give of our money. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 and 8 is a great place to kind of cap up what the essence of giving now is for us. Each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly and not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Give freely in this time from a place of offering, not out of a place of requirement or a feeling of obligation to maintain a certain level to give, but give out of what you're able to so that you can feel that you're answering the call that God has placed in your life to live in line with his heart. And like the woman who offered the two coins in the Gospels, giving of what she felt called to give, nothing more, but also nothing less. Yeah. That's, I think that's a great example there because she didn't have a lot. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in the world today who, who don't have as much or, or have a lot mm -hmm. anymore. But, but she was still willing to give. And I think that's a bit of a challenge there too is to say, you know, we're not bound by this 10%. If, you know, it, it's a great measurement a lot of people use and I encourage them if they're below that to maybe push towards that. It's, it's a great thing to push towards. But if they're in a season where that would cause a ridiculous hardship upon a family, you're perfectly concerned what can you give? What is God calling you to give? Because we still want to be practicing uh, to be living in faith, yeah. to, to not be living in secure in money, but mm -hmm. to be living in secure in Christ. And, and so we need to step out in faith on that. And so that maybe isn't 10%, but, but maybe even the season you're in right now, it is still something that, that would, you'd want to contribute to the Lord's work um, and to see how, uh, how he blesses you through that spiritually, but also potentially materially and financially as well. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. So moving into our uh, fourth question for today yeah. uh, is, is one that's a little heavier again. Yeah, it's a good right? one. But it's a good one. It's a good yeah. one to end with, I think. Yeah. 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 And so the question that came in was, um, during these times, there's all these big name Christians and celebrities, people of faith that are leaving the faith and becoming atheists. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe you're not fully aware of these. Maybe these aren't names that you know. Um, but there are lots of people that have been at the front lines of leadership in many different formats and areas and really 
well-known public Christian figures, and they have come out and made statements about their now disbelief in God. Yeah. And so four quick examples, just to kind of give you a little bit of, uh, of a framework as to who these people are. There's an author, his name is Josh Harris, who has come out, also a Hillsong worship leader, Marty Sampson, uh, a frontline singer for a Christian metal band, Spencer Chamberlain, and also from another Christian rock band that was very influential. These yeah. two are influential in my, my uh, walk, as I shared last week. Um, but Hawk Nelson, uh, John Steingard. Yeah. I think John Steingard might be, it's probably the most recent one. Mm. It was just within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. He made that announcement, and that may even be what prompted this particular question, because time-wise, it lines up a bit. And so, uh, you know... To some degree, we can't answer this question yeah. because we, we don't know these people personally. We don't know all of their journals per, journeys personally. And so there's some limitations to the answer we can give. But here's what we can decipher from reading their personal statements is that all of them have some commonality in their stories. And what you'll find in many, many of these stories is that these people were raised in Christian homes but at some point on their journey, maybe when they were youth, young adults, is a common time for this to happen, but not only then, but in that adulthood as well, they reach a point where there's a lot of questions that come into their mind. They reach a point where they start to have doubts about their faith. And that's natural to happen as a person goes from having mom and dad's faith to owning a personal faith. There's doubts and questions that naturally arise. And yet in all these stories, we also find the commonality that they did not have a safe Christian community in which to share their doubts, in which to share their questions. And, and maybe many people who are watching us today have felt the same, have experienced or heard stories that are very similar to that of, of those who grew up in the church or strong Christian families, and yet they didn't have a safe place in which to share their questions and doubts. And what they did find was a safe place in the anti-religion communities of the world around us, in the atheist communities, who are more than happy to receive doubting Christians and questioning Christians into their masses and lead them to a place where they don't find the answers that we would hope that they would find for their questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what is some of the reasoning behind these four that we've shared above? So we've got a few quotes on their statements, what they made when they publicly mm -hmm. uh, denounced their belief. And so... For Marty Sampson, the Hillsong yeah. worship leader, a very public uh, voice, said, said this. This is a soapbox moment, so here I go. How many preachers fall? Many. No one talks about it. How many miracles happen? Not many. No one talks about it. Why is the Bible full of contradictions? No one talks about it. How can God be love, yet send four billion people to a place all because they don't believe? No one talks about it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a cry of, of a place where there's, nobody's talking about anything. Yeah, lots of questions, lots of doubts, but no place to talk and have answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Spencer Chamberlain said this while he struggled with a drug addiction. The Christian community is what ruins Christianity for me. Recalling his own experience with drug addiction, this is Chamberlain. Chamberlain says inside the Christian community, it's very alienating to be a leader or role model with a problem. This isn't just uh, somebody in the pew. It could be a pastor. It could be the frontline singer of a, of a very prominent band um, that, that is struggling in, with something in his life. And he, and he found it that it was a place where the community ruined it for him. Yeah. Yeah. And then John Steingart just came out and said, I've been terrified to post this for a while. Just think about that one phrase. Yeah. He's been terrified to be honest with his community for a while but it feels like it's time for me to be honest. I hope this is not the end of the conversation, but the beginning. Again, not the end, but the beginning of a conversation is starting with him leaving the conversation almost. And so a place where he hasn't even been able to begin the conversation yet. I hope that this is encouraging to people who might feel the same way, but are afraid to speak as I am. I want to be open. I want to be transparent with you all and also open to having my heart changed in the future. He's, this, this is a cry for, I want to be able to doubt. I yeah. want help, but nobody yeah. has been there for him. I'm not looking to debate this at all, he says. Just a chance to share his story in the hopes some good can come. Again, words like a chance. I was afraid. These, this doesn't seem like a Christian yeah. community that's been accepting, so Absolutely. what do we do? Yeah, you know, before we go any further, I think we have to just absolutely establish 
a fact that I firmly believe in, and that is that everyone has questions. Everyone has doubts. The reality of who God is, the reality of, of some of the core tenets of our faith are so massive. How could we not have questions at some times? How could we not have doubts at some moments? And, and to some people, it happens more or less. Some people have more than others have. Some people have serious lingering doubts. Others have more fleeting moments. But, but it happens to all of us. It, it happens to me, even as a pastor. Andrew? Yeah, yeah, me I, too. I don't totally. want to speak for you, no, but right. I'm pretty sure yeah. we can agree on this. You know, just because they attach the word pastor to your name and we start glowing at that moment, it, it doesn't mean that we become immune to these doubts and questions. We still struggle and wrestle with things at times. And this isn't new. This is something that's happened uh, for, for generations, even going back to Jesus and his early disciples. Consider, for example, one of his disciples who was known as the doubter, Thomas. Doubting Thomas is how he's referred to. And we don't know a ton about Thomas, but, but there's three passages, and, and I think these are illuminating to this situation a little bit that we find. And here's the three really brief passages where we find, we find Thomas's. There's this first one in John chapter 11, where we know that people in Jerusalem are plotting to kill Jesus. And then Jesus is traveling elsewhere, but he hears that his friend Lazarus has died, and he wants to return to, to visit him in Bethany, which is near Jerusalem. But even with these death threats looming, Jesus is set on going back towards Jerusalem. The disciples don't want to go. They're, they're afraid. Thomas stands up and says, let us go that we may die with him. Here's a guy who's deeply committed to Jesus. He's willing to die for him. He has that relationship with him. And another time, Jesus is warning his disciples of his imminent death and that he'll be leaving them in John chapter 14. And he says, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know the way to the place. And, and I imagine the setting, all the disciples are sitting around kind of staring at each other, not quite sure what Jesus is talking about. Thomas is the one who has the courage to ask what everyone else is thinking, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we possibly know the way? See, I, I don't look down on Thomas for this question. I think he was a courageous man who wanted to know more about Christ, who wanted to know more about this relationship and didn't want to lose that relationship because Jesus mentioned he was going away. And then the third time, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples, but Thomas isn't there. And, and so when he eventually arrives in the room where they're all gathered, they tell him that Jesus was there. And in John 20, Thomas's response is, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And that's the verse that gave him the title, Doubting Thomas. Now notice two things here. First of all, there is so much more to Thomas's identity than just that one verse in John 20 where he questions and doubts. There's so much more to who he is. We've seen from these other examples, he is also a deeply committed follower of Christ who was willing to die for Jesus. We've seen that he's also courageous enough to ask the hard questions. He's courageous enough to risk losing face and reputation by saying, I don't get it. I don't understand. And if he hadn't, consider this, if he hadn't taken that risk, if Thomas hadn't said, Lord, I don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. If he hadn't had the courage to ask the hard question, we would not have Jesus' answer. Jesus' answer that has led many into the kingdom of God because Jesus' response was, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because of Thomas's questioning, we have those powerful words today. But secondly, Jesus and the disciples must have been a safe community for people who doubted and had questions because we never see them ridiculing Thomas going, what's wrong with you, Tom? Just, just believe. We don't see them kicking him out of the band. We don't see them sidelining him from the community. No, instead, they continue to walk with him in unity and fellowship. I imagine that as they sat around campfires, as they walked down roads on a regular basis, they talked about and they wrestled with these things together in community and in fellowship. And they were successful because if we follow Thomas' story to the very, very end, he went on to evangelize what is modern day India today. And probably millions have come to know the Lord, if not more. Because he was allowed to ask us questions, to have them resolved, and then to go forward stronger and more confident in his faith in Jesus Christ. 
If you have questions, if you have doubts, please know from these examples that you are not alone and in fact you are in good company. Because if we're honest, all of us at some point or another, to some degree or another, have questions and doubts. All Christians do. And it's not a sin to have doubts or questions. Consider also, for example, we tell our children, our coworkers, we tell our teammates, if you have a question, just ask. Why don't we find the same freedom in our churches? See, so I firmly believe that doubts and questions are not the problem. Not being able or choosing not to ask them is the problem. I just want to share one other quick example with you that we find in Scripture. Uh, and it happens in the church in Rome, where uh, Paul, in his book, uh, in his letter to, to the church in Rome there, uh, he's talking to believers who have opposing views and questions about matters of faith and freedom. And we find this in, in Romans chapter 14 where Paul starts to address a variety of these issues. And, and, and it's interesting to study what the issues were, but that, that, that won't help this particular point for today. What I want just to focus on in Romans chapter 14 is how he begins to encourage them as they wrestle with these questions and challenges. And he says in Romans 14 verse 1, as he opens the dialogue, the first thing he says to them, accept one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. And as we read on throughout chapter 14, he talks about the strong in the faith and, and the weak in the faith. And the, the strong in the faith are those who are not struggling with this particular question, who are at peace in this particular freedom that they have because of their relationship with Jesus. And, and the weak are those who are having a tough time accepting God's teaching in this particular area. That's, that's where the strong and the weak get qualified. It's not about strong and weak Christians, good and bad Christians. It's not about immature and mature believers. That's not what the strong and the weak mean. It means that there's a difference between those who are doubting and questioning versus those who understand and are at peace. And so as Paul writes into this community where this is taking place, he encourages them to accept one another in verse 1. But then in verse 19, he kind of bookends this whole teaching in the middle. In verse 19, he summarizes it by saying, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Mutual edification. In order for that to happen, somebody has to ask the question. There needs to be a place where they have freedom to ask the question. There needs to be people who are willing to receive the question, enter into it with the person, wrestle with it, but not judge them, cast them out, make them feel guilty, enter into it with them in fellowship and build each other up. And so as we end today, I just want to end with a question for all of you. Are you a safe person? is West Meadows, a collection of people. Are we at West Meadows a safe place for people who are questioning, for people who are wrestling? In particular, we'll find a lot of our youth and young adults will be those who have doubts and questions. If we're not a safe place, people will not grow in their knowledge of God. They'll have limited experiences with him. They'll have a hard time placing their trust in Jesus because of how we receive them. If we're not a safe place, I guarantee you they will also find other communities and not Christian communities. They'll find other communities in the world who will be more than happy to receive them and lead them away from their faith in Christ. Now, I believe that we are a safer place than many. Safer place than a number that I've personally experienced. I have experienced personally here at West Meadows the grace and the acceptance that you have shown to me and my family, and we are far from perfect. We are just, on one level, just average people who love Jesus and trying to find a way in this world. That hasn't always been the case, though. There are some communities that we've experienced and been a part of in the past where it has led to spiritual, relational, and emotional damage to people that I care very deeply about. But since coming here to West Meadows, some healing has been able to start taking place because this is a safer place than many. But I don't want us to be confident that we have arrived yet. And I want us to understand that we do need to examine ourselves and understand how could we be even more of a safe place for those who perhaps aren't being received by other churches or communities that we could 
engage with them in a meaningful, authentic way and lead them towards the truth and the healing nature of Jesus Christ. And as I say those words, my, my heart, my mind immediately goes to our youth and young adults who go through these transitional moments in their lives where they go from mom and dad's faith to having to own their faith and, and make it their own personal faith in relationship with, with Jesus. And in the midst of having to do that, they are bombarded in the schools and universities and society and in social media with all sorts of conflicting messages. And, and I have great deep <laughs> appreciation uh, for Andrew, for your work, as you work with youth and young adults. And so as we end with this question and with our concern for our youth and young adults, just briefly, uh, any advice for us? Yeah. Anything you can offer to us on how we can be that place for them? Totally, yeah. Um, first off, typically youth and young adults, um, part of the reason I like them is because they typically look, talk, act, maybe not the smell part, but they're different <laughs> usually than the regular um, typical, what we picture as the church person, right? And so um, when you encounter them, don't, uh, don't, don't react like they are that different. Um, they, they, they are still human. They are still people. Um, and yeah, and so if you just make them feel comfortable, make them feel like they're accepted, reserve, reserve judgment. Don't, don't start there. Don't try to offer truth, even if they're, they're way out in left field on something they're saying to you. Um, actively listen, engage them, and ask open-ended questions. Um, that's just a great practice with any conversation, really, is to ask open-ended questions because um, it allows them to think and process internally as well. Um, but if a youth comes up to you and asks or they look like they're having a hard time, just care for them, uh, value them being there. And uh, it, it starts with a relationship. Yeah. That is really how, and that's the issue. That was the gap in all four of those quotes yeah. was, there was no relationship where they felt safe enough to be like, I don't get it. Like, I don't get John 3.16. It doesn't make sense. Why? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. It sounds so good. Everybody knows it, but I don't understand it. Um, and so that might be a question somebody asks you, and you might be like, well, that's super easy. You don't have to respond with the, the perfect answer right away, but just say, yeah, like, that's t I, I get it, right? Mm -hmm. And just be there with them. And, yeah, so don't. Just be welcoming, basically, is, is how you do it. And you build that relationship so that you can eventually ask permission to offer truth into their lives so that those doubts can be addressed and they don't just fester, right? Because a doubt that festers is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. But if it's allowed to be spoken um, to somebody and it's received well, and then eventually they're like, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. That's the perfect time to offer that little bit of truth from your life to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And I just want to wrap up our time here today um, with, with a word of prayer to close our service and to close these questions and, and to encourage you to, you know, if there's one or two of these questions that really stood out for you, to, to press a little further into that, your own, uh, your own personal time and your own personal prayer life and see what God can speak to you and how we can lead you to a, a deeper experience of maybe fasting and prayer or of understanding, uh, studying scripture or how for us to be a safe place. Um, so let me pray for us as we wrap up today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. That, uh, that we can question, that we're allowed to have questions, that, that you understand our doubts, that you want to meet us in the midst of them. And so I pray, God, that anybody who's listening to me right now, whether it be uh, a doubt they've had or a question they've had their entire life, one that just creeps up time and time again, or, or whatever it may look like, God, I pray that you would bring people around them. Would you bring people of West Meadows around them to give them a place to process, to to give light to that dark question, to bring truth to the unknown, to bring acceptance and freedom that comes from being allowed to, to release something that we've held inside for so long, that we would invite you into these, these moments of conversation, that, uh, that you would use your people not just to build a relationship, but also we would be carriers and messengers of the Holy Spirit's truth that can change and transform our life. God, for those who are maybe listening to this and, and they feel a prompting of the Spirit to say, this is a place that perhaps I need to engage deeper with. This is a relationship with Jesus I need to press into. I pray, Lord, that they would hit that prayer button at the bottom of the screen right now, that they could express that concern, that doubt, that question, that need for Jesus that could be resolved in their lives today. Thank you for using us as a community, building us as a community, refining us into a safe community. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, thanks for being with us again today. We will be back next week on Father's Day for a special kids edition of Pastor 411. So we're looking forward to that. I hope you are as well. And we will see you then next Sunday, 10 a.m. for West Meadows at Home.